speakers first and then we'll have some Q&A so I'm going to ask you to hold all of your questions until um, everybody's done speaking and then once that's finished we're going to have Kelly from Miami Waterkeeper talk specifically about the uh, sewage leak that I'm sure most of you have heard about that we just recently found out of uh, Virginia Key. So today's speaking we're going to um, start out with uh, Kelly Cox from Miami Waterkeeper and then um, we'll have Cliff Brody speaking um, for uh, Sandra from uh, the Christine Nature Center, uh, followed by Lou Dotson, the assistant program manager at Bill Bags. Um, then we have Noah Youngstrom from the Rosensteel School next door, and Alexandra Ender from Dream and Green, and then I'll be up and I'll speak about our citizen science program. So with that, Kelly. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Ramya mentioned, my name is Kelly Cox. I'm the staff attorney and program director at Miami Waterkeeper. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we do at Miami Waterkeeper. The program is part of the third part in a three part series of, of senior ambassador trainings we've been doing with the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, the Citizen Scientist Program. Uh, and we've been trying to increase environmental awareness here on the Key and also increase environmental activism. So I'll give you a little background about Miami Waterkeeper, and I'll try not to take up too much time, as I will be speaking more about some of our efforts uh, after all the presentations are concluded. Miami Waterkeeper is part of what's called the Greater Waterkeeper Alliance. We're a, sort of a conglomerate of independent nonprofit organizations that spans the entire globe. And today, they're approaching uh, 300 waterkeeper organizations. And I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the Waterkeeper Alliance. Back in the 1960s, there was a group of commercial fishermen that lived along the Hudson River, and they started to notice that the water quality in the Hudson was really declining. And they noticed that it was starting to impact the actual quality and the yield of the fish that they were catching. In fact, the story goes that you could tell what types of, or what color of cars were being produced at the GM plant just upriver based on the color of the fish that were caught that day. So it was starting to become a very real public health problem and also a livelihood problem for these fishermen. And so they got together and they brought what is known as the first citizen suit under the Rivers and Harbors Act, which is a very, very old law from the 1800s um, that allows the fishermen to recover what they've lost uh, based on someone else's pollution. And so these fishermen ended up being successful. So successful, in fact, that they won the first ever citizen's lawsuit against the GM plant. And this is the first instance of them using the Rivers and Harbors Act to do so. And they won a small amount award, a small award, only $2,000. But with that award, they bought a patrol boat. And what they did was they said, you know, we're not going to let this type of pollution happen ever again. And so we're going to patrol these waterways ourselves. And we're going to take uh, the accountability upon ourselves to so, and that's what they did. And so they started to hold polluters accountable more and more frequently in a court of law. And by the 1980s, this type of framework started to catch on like wildfire. And someone named Bobby Kennedy came to realize that this was a really effective way to protect our individual watersheds, our rivers, our creeks, our lakes, our streams, our oceans, our bays, all across the globe. And so by the 1990s, the Waterkeeper Alliance was formed. And the Waterkeeper Alliance is an umbrella organization under which we fall that provides resources for us um, and strategy for us to protect our watershed. So our mission here at Miami Waterkeeper, we were founded in 2010, is to protect South Florida's waterways um, and to provide swimmable, drinkable, and fishable water. And those words are pretty catchy. And that's because they're pulled directly from the text of the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act bestows rights upon all of us as citizens to have swimmable, drinkable, and fishable water. And so that's why it's part of our mission at Miami Waterkeeper. Next. Our jurisdiction uh, extends through Broward County 
and all the way down through Dade County. We actually just received a um, sphere of influence increase, so we are now uh, encapsulating parts of Monroe County as well, including the, the Florida Reef Track that extends down through the Keys. Uh, but this is generally where we work, and we protect uh, Biscayne Bay, as you can see, um, the Atlantic Ocean, and then of course the watershed that lies within that boundary. So we use community outreach and education, scientific research, and legal advocacy where necessary um, to achieve protected marine ecosystems, sea level rise readiness in South Florida, and of course swimmable, drinkable, fishable water, that clean water that our economy and all of South Florida truly relies on. So we have a lot of issues that we're working on. In fact, we have too many issues that we're working on. We regularly have to say no to things um, that we want to be involved of due to capacity constraints and those types of things. But just to give you some ideas, we have ongoing litigation against uh, the Army Corps of Engineers in both the Port Miami and Port Everglades cases. In Port Miami, just a few years ago, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, decided to expand the port to accommodate post Panamax shipping vessels. And those vessels are these really big boats um, that were built following the expansion of the Panama Canal. The idea being that we want to increase commerce, um, which would then increase jobs here in Miami-Dade County. The problem was, was that the Army Corps didn't ad adequately consider the amount of coral reef resources that we have just offshore uh, here in Miami. And what, they ended up, what ended up happening through a series of events, which I won't uh, bother you all with the details, but over 250 acres of our coral reef was smothered with dredging sediment in that case. And for those of you who know anything about corals, you know that they need to photosynthesize to live. And imagine dumping a bunch of sand on a tree. Uh, it's not going to be very successful at reproducing and living and surviving. And the same can be said for our coral reefs out there um, near, near government cut. And so we ended up bringing an Endangered Species Act lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers to hold them accountable and to recover those coral resources that were lost through that project. And we brought a preemptive lawsuit in Port Everglades, just 30 miles up the road, to make sure that that type of harm to our coral reefs doesn't happen in the Port Everglades expansion as well. And that's, uh, that case has stayed right now, but it's pending the release of new environmental documents. We have already successfully in Port Everglades delayed the dredging by uh, until 2019 at this point. Uh, we hope to delay it even further. Uh, and in Port Miami, we've already secured over $14 million worth of public benefit uh, by, through our coral restoration efforts that have stemmed from, from that legal action. So we do have some very measurable uh, uh, successes that have come from our, from our focus on these issues, especially through legal advocacy. We're also dabbling lightly in these FPL issues related to Turkey Point. Many of you know that we have uh, nuclear reactors that sit just along the coast of Biscayne Bay down in Homestead, Florida, very close to here. And right now, FPL is proposing to expand their generating capacity and add two additional nuclear reactors right along the coast of Biscayne Bay. Unfortunately, those reactors are not going to be sea level rise resilient. Um, they're not really prepared for storm surge. And there's a, a slew of other problems related to the existing plant down at FPL, um, including very major water quality issues um, and also very major economic issues. We've been pay paying for these plants for many years now. Um, FPL is able to finance these major capital infrastructure projects through ratepayer increases. So your own FPL bills have been increasing for what's looking like a project that will never get built. So far we've paid over $280 million for this project, uh, which is estimated to cost anywhere between $13 to $20 billion. Um, and it's looking like it's not going to be built even more and more often uh, due to the wonderful legal advocacy efforts of many of our municipalities. Um, such as Village of Pinecrest, um, City of South Miami, and also many dedicated environmental organizations like the National Parks Conservation Association and um, Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. So th those folks are working really hard to make sure those plants don't get built. And as I mentioned before, um, it's looking more likely that they're not going to get built because um, the, the company Westinghouse, who's owned by Toshiba, recently went bankrupt. So it's looking like they're going to have to go back to square one, but we'll see what happens with that. That's ongoing and we, we work um, lightly in that area. Uh, we also work on protected area, uh, marine protected area issues such as the State National Park. Um, as I mentioned, we do a lot of coral reef protection. 
detection issues, and that's uh, because our executive director, Rachel Silverstein, is a coral scientist, so we have a lot of on-staff knowledge about coral reef issues. Uh, we also do, as I mentioned, sea level rise and flooding um, advocacy work. Um, and then we are most recently engaged in a sewage spill uh, prevention and advocacy, as well as stormwater runoff. So I'll talk a little bit more in depth about that, but um, we do have some expertise in, in sewage spills and what we can do to better address our aging sewage infrastructure. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've had a lot of uh, community action on these issues. We do scientific research. Uh, our executive director, as I mentioned, actually publishes scientific works and research. Uh, with respect to coral reefs, climate change, sedimentation impacts, those types of things. We host uh, numerous events throughout the year if you're looking for ways to get involved. We regularly host volunteer events and things like letter writing campaigns, petition drives, those types of things, as well as fundraiser events. Um, we do a lot of outreach. We regularly present to the public. It's a core part of our mission is to engage people like you in this room to make them aware of the issues that we're facing here in South Florida and uh, to find uh, constructive solutions to those things. We work in policy, um, so we regularly advise municipalities at the local level, we advise at the county level, and we even go up to the state and federal level on occasion um, to advise for policy, decision, policy and decision making. We work closely with the media um, to make our message loud and clear and to raise awareness in the public to things that are going on. So you all might have seen us in the news very recently, last week, um, sounding the alarm for the sewage bill that happened just off of Virginia Key. Um, and we also do education uh, programming. So we have a junior ambassador program, which is targeted at high school students. So if our applications are actually currently open, if any of you know of dedicated high school students who are interested in environmental advocacy. We train them on public speaking skills, on leadership skills, and on um, service learning. So we get them out into the field and we teach them things like how to take water quality samples, um, where marine debris is coming from, why it's important to plant native vegetation, and those types of things. Um, and then finally, we do public comments. Actually, this Friday, we are going up to Fort Lauderdale for a public comment period on the Fort Everglades project. If any of you are interested in joining us, we'd love to have you. Um, it's going to be at the Fort Lauderdale Beach Marriott. And we're going to be talking about why coral reefs are so important to protecting South Florida and um, our infrastructure and also our, our way of life. Um, and we've been recognized for our success, too. Our executive director has received numerous awards including um, Top 20 Environmentalists and various Mighty Hill Visionary Awards, among many other things. And she looks great too, doesn't she? Uh, so this is Rachel here. Um, she actually is on maternity leave right now, so I normally wouldn't be uh, <laughs> giving this presentation, but, uh, but that's our, our fearless leader. And we've been featured in press at the national and global, of course, in the local level as well. As I mentioned, we have a lot of events. We always encourage you to get involved. You can visit our website for event information. Uh, we have a lot of fun events. We do boat tours. We take submersibles out to check out the reefs. We lead volunteer dive events if you're interested in scuba diving with us. Um, and then we do regular volunteer service events, especially out here on Key Biscayne and, and Virginia Key. And, and that's us in a nutshell, and I'm always happy to answer any questions you may have. I encourage you all to follow us on social media and uh, to get more involved and to stay on top of these issues. You can also join our email list. I have a sign-up sheet in the back, um, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have after the next presentation. Is the information that was on the previous slide, is it in the back? Uh, in the back. Thought we would, I would be here today to bring things down a little bit more locally as to what we're doing right here on, on Key Biscayne in terms of recycling and also in terms of sea level rise. Well, let me cover the condos first. <clears throat> when Key Biscayne first incorporated um, and we moved from the county trash collection system to uh, having our own local one, we took a hard look at whether the condos should be included in the village program or not. And it, it readily became apparent that the different condos requirements were so unique that it wasn't possible to put it, include them into a municipal-wide program. So here on Key Biscayne, each of the condos do their own program. 
Uh, if you live in a condo and you are uncertain just what your program is, you can talk to your uh, condominium management group and they can tell you exactly how it works in your condo. Uh, I live in the Sands and I'll just tell you the program there because I think every, every condo has a pretty similar program. But uh, we have trash chutes in there where our, our trash goes down the chute. There's rules about how you package it, how big the package, the bag can be, and, and so forth. And then every, each one of the units has a relatively small, compared to houses anyway, blue container. And we put our recycles in the blue container and you put them outside of your door whenever your container is full. And by golly, by that evening, the stuff has disappeared. <laughs> but uh, the condo comes around and picks that recycled stuff up in our condo every day. Which so, condo are you in, sir? The Sands. Thank you. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a very good program. So, but let's so let's talk about the the, the houses, the, the trash removal and the, and the recycling of the trash. And every house, every house in Key Biscayne has a green container, at least one. Some houses have two. Some may even have more than two. Trash is picked up twice a week. The uh, the days vary uh, depending where on the island you're located. There's three different three different areas, so what, which of those two days it is uh, does, does change depending on what street you live on. Uh, on the second day of the week picked up, for example, if your pickup was Tuesday and Friday, on Friday, as well as picking up the trash, the pickup will pick up uh, yard trash, grass clippings, small limbs, and that type of thing, and up to, up to six bags each way, no more than than 50 pounds of yard trash and that stuff. So you can, each week you can move out, move a lot of stuff out. Um, on <clears throat> bulk trash, uh, that's picked up once a month. And, um, and it depends, what day of the month, it, it, it varies from, it varies from month to month, but I can tell you that this month, it's on Monday, this coming Monday. Uh, you need to get your bulky stuff out to the curb uh, by 7 o'clock in the morning and no more than 24 hours ahead. So you've got all day Sunday basically basically to get it get it out there. Uh, you can include a lot relative to other other programs. We really, really pick up well, just about everything. Household furniture, trash, white goods. Be sure to take the door off of your refrigerator before you put it out there so that the kid doesn't get inside and suffocate. Um, uh, and, uh, it is, the truck that comes around is a big, giant truck with big mechanical arms to pick the stuff up. So be sure that when you put it out by the uh, curb, not to put it near trees, fences, utility poles, mailboxes, and that stuff. You cannot not put construction material out, out there. That has to be removed by your contractor, whoever whoever's doing that and stuff so stuff like concrete rock soil paint and hazardous materials cannot go in the bulk the bulk uh, pickup next slide um, moving on to recycling it's on Wednesdays it's the blue container you put you put the, <coughs> everything to be recycled in the blue container you do not have to sort out the different kinds of recyclables we'll take it all together and we do the uh, we do the, the sorting for you, which is, is great. I, we live part of the year, used to live part of the year in Vermont, and there we had to sort out all the different kinds of recycling. You don't have to do the, that here. It's really, really very easy. What can you recycle in those blue containers? Steel and aluminum cans, plastic and glass bottles, aluminum foil, paper cartons, cereal boxes, newspapers and magazines, and this one is important for you, cut or folded boxes. If you put a box in that blue container without folding it up or cutting it into pieces, it's going to get stuck in the container. And the, the big mechanical truck's going to come by and dump that stuff out of there. That, that box is still going to be in there. It's going to go back there, and then you're going to put other stuff on top of it, not noticing it either. And pretty soon you've got a smelly, stinky situation you've got to clean up. So be sure that those boxes are, are not just, just, just put in there. How about plastic bags? I'm going to get to that. Okay. That's my favorite subject. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, next slide. Here's what you can't put in the blue containers. Light bulbs, china, glassware, food trays, plastic wrap, and in big letters, plastic bags, styrofoam, batteries, paint, hazardous materials, and electronics. But don't worry, we've got an answer for that stuff, too. You don't have to live with it. Next slide. So here, the, here's the same slide and what you do with those items I just covered. Light bulbs. At Public Works Department, which is on the second floor of the village, village hall, they have special containers for light bulbs. You can take them during business hours, anytime. You can take them over there and put them in those special containers. China goes into green containers, the trash containers, as does glassware, food trays, and plastic wrap. Please put the plastic bags in the trash, not in the recycling. Here's why. Not only can we not recycle them, but they screw up the machine that does the sorting. So if there's plastic bags in the recycle, about every two or three hours they've got to shut down the whole sorting machine and clean the plastic bags manually out of, out of the machine. So please, please, please don't put those plastic bags in the recycle. A styrofoam, batteries, and paint, and hazardous, uh, um, and hazardous materials. Um, let's see, plastic bags. Styrofoam goes in the green containers. Batteries, again, there's a special bin for batteries in the public works department. You can take them there during business hours and put them there. Paint and hazardous materials. The village does not have the facilities to recycle those, but if you contact the Public Works Department, their number is on the, on the screen, they will direct you to the nearest county uh, facility that you can dispose of that kind of stuff. Um, electronics. Save your electronics, and once a year we recycle the electronics, and, and it's always so there's always emails, stuff, uh, advertising in the Islander, and Channel 77 uh, as, to, as to when and how and where the electronics are going to go. So that, that pretty much covers the waterfront. So that's a lot of material, so we're going to have a test and see uh, how, you, <laughs> just a second, how you retain that, but Ramya wouldn't let me do a test, so there are brochures in the back that have all this information on it as well as maps that show you what they believe your particular location is. Your question. Well, I saw glassware there, but I remember that I saw bottles, glass bottles on the other screen. Well, yeah, so like a drink, you know, a glassware like you put on your dining room table or on your table. That should not be recycled. That should go in the trash. Okay. But plastic bottles, uh, glass, glass bottles, glass bottles can be recycled. Okay. They should go in the recycle. Okay, got it. Any other questions? Can you go back to the garbage thing that was before the, uh, I think it was before the land? We're going to make all of these slides uh, available online. Are available. And, and also, uh, Joanne, uh, if you brochures in the back have all, all that on it. Oh, you pick up a brochure. Okay. And have it for you. Uh, that's the end of my slide presentation, but I want to talk about sea level rise. I can't do a, do a slide of what the village is doing about sea level rise because there's nothing to take a picture of yet, which is a good thing. But we are starting to feel the effects of sea level rise right now in Kibitz Canyon. The village has a plan for, for addressing this issue. It's obviously a huge, huge issue. Right now, uh, anyone that's a boater or, or spends any time on the beach knows that the Low tides are higher than they used to be, and the high tides are higher than they used to be. But generally speaking, they're not a problem yet, except at the time of king tides. King tide, in the spring and the fall, the earth is closer to the sun than it is the rest of the year. So king, that's when, you know, tides, of course, are controlled by the, the uh, gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. So when you have a full moon, in the spring or the fall, that's when you're going to have the highest tides. The, the high tides that come on the full moon coming up in October will be our next king tide event. Now, our situation with the king tides right now on the key 
is we are get, we do get water to back up into the uh, stormwater system, and at the peak of uh, king tides, it's right at the grates in the in the in the uh, stormwater system. You can you can you can see the water; it's right there. It hasn't started to spill out into the streets yet, but it's right there. We seem to be, and, and this hasn't been scientifically tested, but just by empirical observation, it appears we're about eight inches better off than Miami Beach. So when Miami Beach is, on King Tides has four inches of water on Alton Road, or used to before they had the pumps, we'll see how that works. Um, the, we have the water just right at the, get, at the grates. And some of, the, some of the condos, not all of them, but some of them are getting water and king ties in their lower uh, their lower parking garage. Of course, this problem all goes away in six hours. The tides change every six hours, so boom, low tide, everything's gone. So it's it's not a huge problem today, but it's it's show, it's coming. It's coming. So what's the village doing about it? Well, the first thing that we've done, and this is this is work that's completed is we put black backflow devices in the storm and water system. So we'll see in October when we have high tides, but that water shouldn't come back into the storm sewer system because there's now there's valves there that close and don't let the water come back until the tide goes down and then they open up and out it goes. Um, the next step will be to put backflow devices in the actual drainage wells because as if this problem gets worse, water will start to back up right into the wells. And then long range, uh, the village is already planning on, the, uh, on methodology to raise the infrastructure in low-lying areas uh, you know, to deal with the, the, um, the, higher, the higher water. And, um, but the, the big thing that the village is doing, and it's on a fast track right now, Planning and permitting uh, is happening right now this month to do a major beach restoration. Not, not what you've seen here in the past where we've done a little bit, but I mean something, something very major. Because that is our first line of defense against higher, higher water, is having, having a big, strong, powerful beach. So that is moving forward right now, and of course we um, we get the side effect of that of having a beautiful beach out there to to to, uh, to enjoy. So that that's what's going on right now with sea level level rise on um, on Tevis Cane. So if there's any questions about that or the uh, recycling, I'll be here for the rest of the program. I'll be glad to talk to you about it afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Cliff. for having me. Um, I'm Sandra St. Hilaire. I'm the program director at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Biscayne Nature Center. Um, if you haven't been to visit us before, um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so I know many of you have, but if you haven't, we're right in Crandon Park in the North Beach entrance of the park, and um, we've got a beautiful facility um, that you can come and check out. We've got some nice aquariums and some really nice exhibits, and then um, what we really specialize in is taking people out really into your own backyard to discover the beautiful wildlife that we have here in South Florida from the seagrass beds and the mangroves um, to the coastal hammock ecosystem and um, also in the park we have at the north end of the preserve we have a really um, unique ecosystem which is a fossilized reef. It's one of only two in the entire world, the other one is in Southeast Asia, um, and it's actually the fossilized remains of seagrass blades. So um, it, people used to believe that it was fossilized mangrove roots, but now the new um, science says that it's actually fossilized seagrass roots and blades. So that's a really interesting ecosystem to explore. Is that when you ride your bike all the way to the tip and you look at the shrub? Is that where the? Yep. Oh. Yeah. So if you ride, if you ride your bike all the way down that trail um, behind the nature center through the Bear Cut Preserve. And actually, if you, if you change the slide for me, I could show you. Well, there's a picture of the center. Um, but if you if you ride all the way from the center, so the center is right 
over here, and then if you ride all the way to the tip, you can kind of see where this sandy area is here, where that, those flats are. That's where the fossilized reef is, and um, that's a really unique and special habitat. Um, we've got a lot of juvenile sharks, uh, spiny lobster, shrimp, other economically important species there. So um, one of the things that we love to do is to take um, kids, especially, into that ecosystem and teach them about all of the interesting organisms that live there. Um, so the Nature Center started in 1969 when a group of Miami Dade school teachers was finding it hard to teach science in the classroom. And um, led by Mabel Miller, they began an outdoor education program in Crandon Park out of the back of a hot dog stand. And um, they started taking kids out into the seagrass beds and through the coastal hammock and the mangroves um, and teaching them about the wildlife there. And um, then they went to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in the 1970s and asked her to help them spearhead um, a project to get a nature center by the sea started. And it became, at the age of, of 98, um, it became one of Marjorie's um, passion projects. And she worked uh, with this group of school teachers at the Junior League of Miami and other groups as well um, to create the group, the Biscayne Nature Center, which became a not-for-profit organization. And in the year 2000, um, after raising $4 million, the Biscayne Nature Center was built uh, right there in the north end of Crandon. And uh, we've been doing environmental programs out of the, the center ever since. And it went through many iterations before the building was built, from hot dog stands to a chicky hut to a little trailer. And now we've got this beautiful building that um, we've got a state-of-the-art lab and classroom in. So um, we've come a long way. We're still moving towards um, new and exciting projects. So, um, you know, please come visit us if you change the slide for me. Um, so the mission of the center is um, to dedicate ourselves towards environmental education and the encouragement of greater citizen participation in the protection of our natural environment. So there's a really famous quote that you'll protect what you love. So what we do is we teach kids to love uh, nature. And the best way to do that, kids today, um, spend so much time indoors and in the air conditioning, playing video games or watching TV, or they're not allowed to ride their bike. We're really lucky here on Keep Escape because kids can ride their bike outside or skateboard or, you know, it's safe for them to be outside. But in most of Miami, that's not the case. So um, we really bring kids out into nature, and um, we also bring a lot of kids from the inner city to the nature center. So a lot of those children have never been even to the beach before, despite living only a few miles away. So, you switch this. So this is this is a group of kids um, who came out to the nature center last summer um, for our month-long summer camp, which we partner with the Key Biscayne Community Foundation um, to put on. It's a full month of programming for each year. We choose a different group. This group was from Liberty City, um, and on the first day of camp, they. 98% of them had never been to the beach or in the ocean before. None of them knew how to swim. Um, and by the end of the month, they were all swimmers, uh, which in itself is amazing. And they were all really passionate about nature. Um, so they were scooping their nets through the seagrass, catching baby puffer fish, seahorses, little juvenile lobsters, all sorts of different animals. and. Um, to see their faces the first time that they held, um, you know, a little snapper in their hands or the first time that they looked at a seahorse up close is really, really magical. And um, that's kind of how the Nature Center um, sees um, the future of environmentalism and conservation is sparking an interest in the next generation. And I've just got a few pictures to share with you because I think picture says a thousand words rather than me going on and on. You can just see um, how excited the kids are. And um, 
you know, just how into it they are. And keeping in mind that many of these kids have really never been swimming, snorkeling, wading through the seagrass before. So um, this is another one of our signature programs. It's called Coastal Ecology for groups who don't want to or their school won't allow them to go in the water. Um, we'll take them on a really interesting hike along the shoreline and through the hammock and um, we pick up uh, specimens at the high tide line and teach the kids about those. And also um, a big part of this program is learning about tides and currents um, and also climate change. So um, we're bringing all of that information as well, but in an outdoor and informal setting. So here, yeah, there they are in the hammock. And then we also do uh, a lot of regular service learning. So um, two Saturdays a month, the first and second Saturday, we have an eco restoration day, and then the second Saturday a beach cleanup. So um, different groups from the community or anyone who calls to come on one of those two days can join us um, to do a little bit of service learning. And within that, we don't just do a beach cleanup. We also really do kind of like a little lecture at the beginning and at the end to see what people have learned and um, how they can impact the environment. And what we're spearheading this year is plastic-free BNC. Um, so we're cutting all use of our single-use plastics we're asking schools to come with reusable water bottles, no single-use water bottles, no single-use Ziploc bags or plastic bags, um, and really moving towards a more sustainable program and also getting that in the minds of all of the schools and people who come to visit us. So hopefully we'll spark a more sustainable future for the center <coughs> and for all of Miami. Um, and then another thing that we've recently started doing um, with the help of the Key Biscayne Community Foundation is doing regular water monitoring. So um, we have these really awesome kits from Philippe Cousteau's organization, Earth Echo, and um, they're very simple to use. Um, if you come out to the Nature Center, we'll teach you how to use them. Um, and you can monitor temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, and turbidity. Um, so we give kids the tools to measure those things and we're keeping track over time of how all of those different environmental indicators are changing and um, we have some ideas of what we're going to do with that data but for now we're just collecting um, until we have a good data set that we can actually kind of get some information from. So that's been going on for about uh, five months now. Um, and that was a picture of Philippe Pusto, who actually came out to the Nature Center. We had a really great day with Miami Waterkeeper um, and the Cubis Gate Community Foundation. And the kids all got to meet Philippe, and they were very starstruck by him. Um, so that's just their, their little logo there. Um, and that's one of the kids. And then, um, yeah, these are just a group of kids who came out. So we actually had 200 kids that day. We have over 200 children almost every day who come to visit us between uh, our organization and Miami-Dade County Public Schools. So we've got lots of young people who are interested, engaged, they want to learn. So we're always looking for volunteers and helpers and um, I have cards in the back. So if you're interested in volunteering or um, helping us in any way, uh, my information is in the back. And um, our big new exciting news is that we recently got a $200,000 appropriation from the state of Florida and we're going to be raising matching funds and we're going to be completely redoing our exhibit space um, to better reflect the current issues that Key Biscayne and Miami are facing like climate change, sea level rise, marine debris, and um, really focus our exhibits on those things. So. Um, if you have any ideas of what you want to see in our upcoming exhibits or um, any input that you like, please feel free to email me. Um, and again, my cards are in the back. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. Bill Bates, Cape Florida State Park, one of the 174 state parks within the state of Florida, triple gold medal 
winning parts for our of our state. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Cape Florida. That's new and different. But first, I'll remind you that the mission statement of Florida Cape, uh, Park Service is to provide resource-based recreation while preser preserving, interpreting, and restoring natural and cultural resources. You probably all know that Cape Florida is the oldest historic structure in the Miami-Dade County, commonly referred to as El Farito by the people who know and love it, the little lighthouse. Uh, we are 500 plus acres. We were leveled in 1992 by uh, Hurricane Andrew and uh, were able at that time to replant the entire park with native species. So 25 years later, we are a grand ecological and biological experiment gone right. And we're seeing um, a beautiful park with very little incursion of non-native species. I arrived at Cape Florida a year ago on Memorial Day. And my first weekend of work, I spent pulling trash and doing uh, to get a feel for what my rangers do every, every day. So in addition to the fun facts that I've just told you, we also have 147 garbage cans, 19 picnic pavilions, eight fishing piers. We see almost one million visitors a year in our park. And on Saturdays and Sundays, year-round almost, we have between eight and 10,000 visitors in the afternoons. And at the end of the day, it looks like 30,000 visitors. <laughs> When I arrived at the park, there was not a uh, regularly scheduled volunteer beach cleanup, and I began to get one organized by September of 2016. The participation started at 7 to 10 people, and it's gradually grown to be 100 to 200 people. We have done that with the support of the community, of the Key Game Community Foundation, the Water Keepers, and Citizen Science Program, both through monetary support and advertising given to our uh, beach cleanup, aptly titled the Second Saturday Monthly Beach Cleanup, just in case you forget. <laughs> so the biggest accomplishment, besides just the general picking up of things, is that we have generated, I feel, a renewed interest um, in volunteerism at our park, which had seemed to fall off. And that's within the Biscayne community and also within the greater Miami area. It has spread also to other efforts um, within our Key Biscayne community, like Ripples in a Pond. So we see a lot of different smaller community organizations picking certain places on the beach to clean up, and I'm happy to see that. It truly takes a village to be responsible to our environment. So you had already mentioned uh, my favorite quote. I'll share it with you in its entirety. Baba Dayum, the Senegalese uh, poet, once said, poet and environmentalist, once said, in the end, we conserve only what we love. We love only what we understand, and we only understand what we are taught. So that philosophy is what um, influences me every time I go to a second Saturday monthly beach cleanup. Uh, volunteers get educated about the problems the environment faces. We play trash trivia and give out prizes for right answers. Um, we weigh everyone's trash so that the three heaviest bags of trash win a recycled beach enjoyment kit, which is made up of all the fun things I find on the beach when I'm helping with cleanups, such as beach umbrellas, beach chairs, beach balls, all kinds of beach toys. And combined with that, we give away free pass to Florida state parks that can be used in any state park in Florida. So it's about the education. I don't think that punishment gets too far and doesn't seem to make a difference in a lot of cases. But if you can create care for your environment and care for what is happening, 
I think that that is a much more positive way, and that's what we strive to do, in addition to just getting people out there on the beach and visible to the public, so that they're seeing that volunteers are picking up the litter at the beach. To give you an idea of what volunteers have been able to accomplish, January, 203 pounds of trash. This is when two hours, two hours. They picked up 203 pounds, 100 volunteers, 143 pounds with 90. And I can go on and on. I do turn in these statistics to Romeo um, on a regular basis. That added up to 1,251.42 pounds of trash picked up on one Saturday a month by a total of 726 volunteers. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Very proud to say those numbers to you. Now, by comparison, our rangers pick up an average of 16 tons of garbage per month for the park. I know I'm not saying that for any other reason, just to give you a comparison. This includes picnic areas as well as the beach, all those 147 garbage cans and 19 picnic pavilions and all of the uh, surrounding areas. But both are important numbers. Rangers keep the park clean through tremendous ongoing efforts. I have 13 staff members for that 16 tons of trash. Do the math there for a minute. They are all dedicated to keeping the park clean and they're dedicated to helping volunteers when they come to help get our park clean. The volunteers show the beach-going community that they care about the environment, and I think that that creation of the atmosphere of care is one of the most important messages that we can give to the public. Now I'm going to share some tracks trivia facts with you. 81.5% of littering acts are deliberate. That means that somebody thinks, 80% of people think, before they drop that thing on the ground. Under the age of 19, the people under the age of 19 are more likely to litter than older people. And then the next age group is 21 to 35 or more, are three times more likely to litter than age 50 and up. And I bet everybody's cleaned up after their kids going, yeah, all right. But that's the age group that comes to our cleanups. So they are the ones who are seeing firsthand the result of deliberate acts of litter. And I think that they are hearing the message and that also allows them to take that message back to their peer group in various ways and let them know that they need to change and also that they can help. And as you can see from these pictures, we have dedicated groups of volunteers in Norwegian Cruise Lines. We have individuals, we have families, Many, many of the Keys families come and help us to clean up on the second Saturday. Beach walkers every day are out there helping us to pick up. So it is a small piece of paradise, but it's my piece of paradise and your piece of paradise. And we want to keep it clean and we want to influence the greater community to do good. And I'll end with a quote, and that we cannot do all the good that the world needs, but the world needs all the good that we can do. Thank you. So up next we have uh, Noah from uh, the Rose and Steel School right next door at Virginia Key. Thank you for everyone for coming out today. Uh, as as Romy mentioned, my name is Noah Youngstrom. I'm the Senior Development Director at the Rose and Steel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, uh, often referred to as Rasmus. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Torrey White, who's uh, our, our outreach manager at the school. Um, and I just want to thank the Keep Skin Community Foundation for sponsoring our annual Sea Secrets Lecture Series this year, uh, which was which was a grant it wasn't used for. A little bit about our history. We have a, a unique environment where the only subtropical marines, marine school in the United States. Uh, this thoughtful gentleman here is Walton Smith, who was our, is a coral biologist and also our first dean. Um, when you're driving over the Bear Cut uh, Bridge and you see the, the green and white catamaran that's our research vessel, um, which is docked from time to time, it's, uh, it's named for him, so that's the Walton Smith. Um, the school was established in 1943 and was initially called the Marine Laboratory. Um, as we grew, we were renamed the Institute for Marine Science in 1961 
and eventually we got our current name, the Rosenstale School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, after a gener generous gift from Lewis and Dorothy Rosenstale in 1969. Uh, 2018, if you do your math, marks our 75th anniversary. So we're extremely excited for that, and we're going to be celebrating our 75th anniversary in a myriad of ways throughout this year. Uh, so we hope you'll, you'll share in those celebrations with us. Uh, we are located, as I just mentioned, right over the bridge at Bear Cut in the Marine Science Hub, which is comprised of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, uh, Mast Academy High School, the Miami Sea Aquarium, Rasmus, us, and we also include CMIS, which stands for the Cooperative Institute of Marine and Atmospheric Studies. So our research covers a broad range of interdisciplinary studies tackling everything from climate issues, sea level rise, marine conservation, geosciences, oceanography, oceanography and more. Uh, and we seek to use our findings to support the creation of important environmental policy. We also have a bar on campus called the Wet Lab, which is open Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday evening. So uh, if you haven't been, we encourage you to check it out. Very helpful for science <laughs> research. <Yeah. laughs> uh, at our school, we have roughly 400 undergraduate students that spend most of their time on the main campus in Coral Gables, uh, 300 graduate students, 200 staff members like Tori and I, uh, and 100 faculty members who represent a global Uh, so for over 20 years, we've hosted our Sea Secrets Lecture Series, which is what uh, the, the Cuba Scan Community Foundation funded this year. Um, and it, it features, it's, it's free to the public, it has a reception, uh, and then it brings together top minds in science from around the world to discuss a myriad of environmental issues. Um, so a few of our speakers for, for this year, all our speakers from this year are featured, uh, but one is uh, Brian Scarry who's a National Geographic underwater photojournalist. Uh, Brian gave us a sneak peek at the first uh, sitting president who was, who was um, taking pictures of underwater. Uh, that was Barack Obama at Midway Atoll uh, when he created a marine national monument there. Uh, also, right next to him, uh, climatologist and director of NASA's Goddard Institute, Dr. Gavin Schmidt, who shared uh, his Choosing Our Climate Adventure lecture with us, which featured some incredible and a little scary uh, climate models from the past, present, and future. Uh, and then also one of our alumni, Dr. Andrew Baker, who's a coral biologist and, and a faculty member, actually, I've now, who's doing some amazing work creating more resilient corals using a technique called stress hardening. Uh, and you can see Andrew's work at the Frost Science Museum, where he is a 2016 Cap Sky prize winner. So that's, that's the end of my presentation. I, I just want to encourage you all to get involved with the school, come out to our 75th anniversary events, um, and I also really want to thank the Cuba State Community Foundation uh, and the EPA for helping to support our Sea Secrets Lecture Series. If you're interested in getting in our mailing list, um, I'm going to stick around. I have some business cards. If you take my business card and email me, I'll happily add you uh, so you get those sent to me. Add you, uh, so you get those sent to you. So I'm with Dream and Green. I'm the program manager, Alexandra Ender. So if nobody's familiar, Dream and Green is a Miami-based nonprofit. We've been around for about 11 years. Um, for our mission, you can next slide. Um, the mission of our program is to um, empower individuals to respond to climate change, and we do that by developing and implementing, overseeing educational programs and workshops um, to promote sustainable behaviors to all age groups, but with a specific focus for K through 12 students. So we have two programs, and one is the Green Schools Challenge, and the other is the WeLab Lab, or the Water Energy Learning Behavior. The WeLab Lab program is what we're partnering with the Kingston Community Foundation with. So just to give you a little, um, a little background on the Green Schools Challenge, you know, every year we're in about 100 schools annually in Miami-Dade and um, Broward County, and we, what we do is we you know, bring environmental education to the children. So we're teaching them about recycling, water conservation, um, food efficiency, green living, green buildings, that kind of thing. And so the impact that we have specifically in Miami-Dade County for the public schools to date that we've saved them, you know, $26 million in their energy costs, their water savings, and 
so we're hoping to do that you know every year more and more and get more schools enrolled so that uh, we're currently in the enrollment period for the 2017-18 program so if anybody knows any schools that would like to enroll you just go to our website and fill an application and you know that the same Presbyterian school is what is one of our top schools so if you need any help so the next program that we have is the We Lab program, and what we do is we offer workshops to the community. I see a couple of people that already attended the workshop I did a few months ago here for this game. Um, we're going to do another one, so I'm sure we will let you know when that's going to be. And what it is, it's an hour-long workshop, and we talk about the water energy nexus um, and how it impacts you, what your county, what your city is doing to conserve energy, water, um, and then also Recycling, we already had a little information on that, but we go into a little bit more depth about recycling. So far we've done about 70 workshops, and that's allowed us to reach over almost 2,000 households. Um, and then also anybody that attends gets a free toolkit, which includes things like um, reusable water bottles, high efficiency shower heads, um, LED light bulbs, that kind of thing. Okay. So just to give you a little you know, summary on what the Water Energy Nexus is, I know that not everybody's familiar that water and energy are connected, and that if you're going to conserve one, you're going to conserve the other. So in some ways that this happens is that it takes a lot of water to cool power plants to produce electricity for your house. About half the water that we extract is used to cool power plants. So if you're going to be you know, using less energy, that's going to require less water to be used to cool those power plants. And then on the other side, it takes a lot of energy to extract that water, to treat that water, to bring that water to you to extract that water once you're done using it and treat that water and bring it back to wherever it goes afterwards. Um, yeah, so a lot of people aren't aware that you do use a lot more water to generate electricity in your house versus what you're using for direct use for things like showering, washing your clothes, brushing your teeth, that kind of thing. So if you're going to make a conscious effort, not just to conserve water you know, in your direct use, but also in your electric use, then you're going to be saving water both ways. Um, so yeah, so that's important because Miami-Dade is a huge county. We have a population of 2.6 million, and that's constantly growing every single year. So we're the third largest county in Florida, the most populous, and so if we're all going to take these conscious efforts to conserve water energy, then you're really going to see a difference. We also talk about, in the workshops, we talk about where your water comes from. We have a representative from the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department come, and he talks um, about where your water comes from. If no one's familiar, it comes from the aquifer, which is below your feet. <laughs> Next slide. Um, and then, you know, what those threats to the aquifer are. So contamination, over-pumping, saltwater intrusion, which also correlates to sea level rise, um, and the, just things that you can do to prevent those kinds of things and protect our water source. So in a nutshell, you know, why do you want to save water and energy, not just to help the planet, but to promote long-term sustainability, but you're also going to be saving money on your bills. So I guess that's the bottom line. That's something that everybody takes home, is that you're going to be saving you know, money on your FBL bill and your water bill, so that's an easy way to get people to realize that they should do that. And so through the workshop, we tell you what are some of the ways that you can do that and some of the simple things that you can just, you know, even take home today is to, you know, maintain your AC, install programmable thermostats, you know, saving on your AC is going to correlate to about 20% in your energy bills if you're going to maintain it well. And also, you know, switching over to LED light bulbs, ceiling leaks, use your fans, that kind of thing. So, and then on the other side, we have um, how you can save water, install high efficiency toilet. If nobody knows, the county does have a rebate program for toilets. So if you want to install a new high efficiency toilet, they will give you $100. It's on their website. So they do offer those kinds of programs. Um, and also to install low flow shower heads, repair leaks, take shorter showers, just simple things that people tend to forget. But they do add up and they do make a difference. Um, so like I said, we're going to be hosting another workshop out here on Key Biscayne. I'm sure Vanille will let you know when that's going to be. If you have any questions about <coughs> either program, I can answer those for you. And thank you. I am the last speaker. Um, and then after me, we're going to have, like I said, Kelly talk about the uh, sewage leak that was discovered off Virginia Key and give you guys an update on what's happening with that. Um, so I'm just going to talk about our citizen science program. We fall under the umbrella of Key Biscayne Community Foundation, and we're supported by the village, by grants, and by donations. Um, our mission, basically, um, in a nutshell, is that we want everybody to learn science. Um, I remember when I was younger, and I was like, in, like undergrad, going into biology, and a lot of my friends that weren't going into biology, doing other things, they were just like, oh, but I hate math, and chemistry is like terrible. You know, but it's not all just like math and chemistry and like 
complex biological systems and things like that. And there are so many easier ways to learn about science and learn about your environment without anything being complex and being involved. It's very, very simple, really. And so we try to make it more accessible to everybody um, without it being some kind of you know, scary, complicated thing. And we have a ton of partners that we work with. Um, all of the schools on the key, including Mass Academy, um, everybody that spoke today, um, a lot of other different clubs and organizations on the key. Um, and we try our very best not just to work with all these different partners, but to get them to work with each other. Um, one of the best ways we find that um, a lot of different things can get accomplished is not just all these different organizations doing things um, by themselves, but working together um, as sort of a web or a net rather than just on their own. Um, there's a lot more that can be accomplished. These are some of the, the projects that we um, get involved in or we sponsor or we at the very least, if another organization that we work with is having one, then we'll do our best to advertise it. Um, a lot of these fall under our, um, I mean, these are all environmental awareness programs. Um, we have a few grants that I'm going to go into later, and a lot of these we are able to sponsor <coughs> through our grants. Um, first of all, uh, before I get to the grants, we have the Key Challenge, which we've been doing uh, every year since, uh, I think, since we started the, the program, which is five years ago. And that basically involves all of the schools on the Key and Mass Academy. And it's kind of like an extended science fair. Um, and there are projects anywhere from photography to doing an entire like, uh, science experiment. Um, or you know, trying to combine different things, writing and painting, um, you know, any different type of art and science. Uh, one of the best projects we had turned in last year was, um, a, it was a mixed media painting uh, that was of a sea turtle and you know a lot of green paint and stuff, but then they also involved plastic bags. So the sea turtle was it was kind of it was basically 2D, but the sea turtle was made out of plastic bags on the actual uh, piece of cardboard or whatever it was on, and it looked really cool actually. And it was done by a bunch of first graders, um, and you know so we get a lot of a lot of interesting projects that are turned in, and the kids really really get into it. So they're not just like being they're not just able to express themselves you know through these different mediums, but then they're also learning quite a lot, you know, obviously like as the, their teacher was working with them to create the sea turtle plastic bag thing, um, she was teaching them why plastic bags are so detrimental to sea turtles, you know, and so it was also, aside from just being a piece of art, it was making a statement. And um, we, so these are some of our winners and some of our um, teachers projects, things like that. Um, we also, like I said, we do have science projects, so the one at the top there, those are actually science projects um, that are up on poster board and they have information. The first one is about mangrove ecosystems, so they painted a mangrove tree and have the different plants and animals that live in that kind of ecosystem. Um, and the other one was just uh, different types of birds that live in um, like the near shore environment. And uh, you know, so they, they try to make them kind of more interesting and more intricate so, so they can learn not just like, you know, plastic bags are bad for sea turtles. Like, while that's true, there's also, you can look at, um, you know, like, a specific ecosystem and what how complicated it is, how many different animals and plants are involved and how the tide affects it and you know things like that. So uh, these are the two grants that we've had over the last year. Um, the EPA grant was great. It was about $90,000. It allowed us to give subgrants to all of the, our speakers today and a few other um, partners who are listed here. And we have them involved in all kinds of different things. Um, they help us with events like beach cleanups or these uh, lectures, which are actually through my waterkeeper. Um, the, the we lab that Alexandra mentioned, um, the, the water testing at Biscayne Nature Center, uh, we talked with these secrets, and then we also work very closely with the village on a lot of different projects. Uh, very recently, I've been talking to the manager of public works about starting a village-sponsored beach cleanup um, in another area that's not currently being normally has beach cleanups, and um, there's also he wants to try to do a, a biannual canal cleanup. So we're, we're looking at you know renting boats and getting volunteers to go out and help pick up trash that gets kind of stuck floating in canals. And you know so we're we're looking at every like as many different ways to you know help keep our island a wonderful paradise and at the same time get as many people involved, including obviously the local government because that's um, one of uh, you know one of the most important players. Um, but again, like also having other organizations involved is really, really helpful because they may have resources that we don't, they may have connections and other people that they can get a hold of that we don't know. And, and it just, like I said, having a bigger net to cast um, makes things much more 
um, just much better as far as like getting things done and, and teaching people and creating you know large scale events that everybody can be involved in. Um, our NOAA grant was specifically geared towards sea level rise, and it was um, the Cubeskin Community Foundation working directly with the village, and then we also had a few contractors that helped with. Um, uh, an assessment, uh, vulnerability assessment of Cuba's game, like how vulnerable we are to uh, sea level rise, what areas will be affected worse, that kind of thing. Um, some of you probably went to the, the two public town halls that we have, um, that we had in the past, and uh, the whole point of this was to get as much information as we could, public input, um, you know, help from the village, and then give help to the village, and, you know, get as much as we could, and then um, it's now at the stage where we're working on a, an adaptation plan. Um, also, you know, working off of the uh, example of Miami Beach, as uh, Cliff mentioned, they're basically the problem that they're having right now will probably have in 20 years. And so kind of looking at them and like what they're dealing with and how they're dealing with it gives us a really good starting point to get ahead of it before we get to that stage. And so that's what we, our NOAA grant was, was one year long, it just ended, and so now we're just doing the, the last bit of uh, putting everything together. Uh, the EPA grant is going for another year, and so we, um, at the very least, under the subgrants, are going to continue working with um, all of our partners um, and doing a lot of the same events that we did over the last year for the next year. And we're hoping that even once our grant runs out, um, one, maybe we'll get another one, <laughs> um, or, you know, a few. And two, that, you know, obviously we've already made these connections. We want to continue working with our partners, and um, we hope to, to continue doing that. Um, this was one of my uh, photography submissions in the Key Challenge, and he called it street, street surfing. I think he was in third or fourth grade, and he said, I just want to put that in there because, you know, sea level rise. And this was during the King Tides last year when he took that picture. Um, another program that we are trying to create into an annual event, we did it once last year, and we have one scheduled this year in September. Um, we're going to start advertising that soon is a reef restoration, and we do that um, through res the Rescue Reef Program, which actually um, falls under uh, the Rosensteel School. Um, one of the professors started it, and he's been growing a coral nursery for, I think, over 10 years now. And basically, um, the quick version is they, uh, you have to be scuba certified and over 18 to be involved, and they take you out on a boat to the coral nursery. You help to clean um, the you know, algae, whatever's growing on the, the coral trees, basically, that they have, and then they, they snip off little pieces, like the, those little, they're called fingerlings, um, they snip off little pieces of coral, they take you out to the reef, and then they show you the different methods of outplanting them. And then this is basically what that looks like after a year. Um, the uh, stag coral that they use is actually very quick growing, and what they hope is that in the past, before there was like a lot of boat traffic and human influence and stuff like that, there used to be thickets of uh, staghorn coral, just like entire areas covered. And obviously we don't have that anymore, but they're hoping to sort of recreate that and also create genetic bridges between the isolated populations. Because right now you just have these little patches of them. They're too far apart from each other to spawn between the, the different populations. And so you end up with a lot of kind of inbreeding basically. And so they're trying to sort of connect these different patches so that there can be more genetic flow. And obviously that would create stronger corals. Um, this was uh, another thing that we do is during the school year we have uh, monthly environmental lectures and they're every third Thursday of the month. Um, this is just one example. We did one on plankton, which sounds really boring. Um, just you hear plankton and that just sounds terrible. But honestly, plankton is super interesting and that's why I included this presentation. There are other possibly more interesting <laughs> um, lectures I could have I could have included. But just looking at these pictures, these were taken by um, our uh, speaker when he was out doing, they were doing plankton trawls and they developed a specific way of um, taking pictures of plankton, which in a lot of cases is really difficult because they're like this. They're translucent. So you can't actually take pictures of them. So they developed this interesting method where basically they would have two, two pieces of equipment. One would shine light through the plankton and then the other one would take pictures of their shadows. And so they have these really super detailed, really cool looking pictures. They almost look like pencil drawings, but they're actual pictures of their shadows. And it was such, uh, it, um, it, was, it worked so well that within a few months they did, I think they had something like 11 million pictures that they needed to go through. And then this is where the citizen science comes in. They, they posted them on this line on um, this uh, website called Zooniverse, and that's like Z-O-O, 
and universe, but without the U at the beginning, so Zooniverse. And basically, you, any random person can log into that, um, get a tutorial on how to identify different plankton species, and then you can start looking through the, their pictures and just start identifying things. And it's actually, it's really interesting. Sometimes you see some really, really crazy, cool stuff. And, and they have this for all kinds of things. So they used it for their plankton. They have it for um, camera traps that are set like in the Serengeti to take pictures of whatever wildlife is there. They do it for penguins. There's a penguin portal. Um, that's why it's called plankton portal, because uh, they're all like these different portals to different uh, scientific studies being done all over the world that need help because they have too many pictures that, to sort through, and they need other people to just like you know come in there. And they actually, the, the plankton guys had uh, one person in particular that identified so many photographs that they included her in their publication uh, because she obviously had gotten so into it, she was really good at it. Next slide. Um, another one of our lectures was about plastic pollution. Um, it was a really depressing lecture, but very important. Um, it, this was, these were all pictures uh, from a, in and around the uh, South Florida area from beach cleanups. This is a Corona bottle with a hermit crab inside. Um, it's alive and it's huge. Somehow it lived in there for a very long time and had to break the bottle to get it out. Who knows how long it was in there, but it managed to crawl in, grow bigger, and then it couldn't ever get out. Um, this, the middle picture is from mangrove roots. Mangrove roots are really, really good at creating sedimentation. They slow down water quite a bit, so when you have a lot of particles in water, they tend to um, fall, like as the, the water like, flow slows down, they tend to fall around the roots of mangroves. The same works for the trash that's in the water. So in mangrove roots, you'll find tons and tons of little bits of trash like that. Um, that last picture is the saddest because each one of those were, are the stomach contents of deceased baby turtles. And all those are little bits of plastic. And that was the reason that they died. Their uh, stomachs full of plastic. And, and again, but to them that looked like food. So, you know, it's just, it, the, the whole idea obviously is to educate people. You know, we don't just want to make them sad about everything, but obviously it's important to, for them to know, like, you know, it's not just the big pieces of trash that you see when you're doing a beach cleanup, like pick up the little ones too. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's just, it's also really important for them to understand the ideas behind it, you know, why you should recycle rather than try to throw things away. And if you, you know, have to throw things away, look into different, like, different things you can do. Um, there are, you know, not around here so much, but there are, like, organizations, for instance, that'll take plastic bags and, like, make them into stuff. There are, however, some stores, I can't think of any offhand, that um, you can, like, they actually have a plastic bag depository. So if you go there shopping, you can bring your plastic bags back and they'll take them back. And so that way you're not con contributing to more tra you know, trash being thrown away and then going to the, the landfill and you know, whatever. Next slide. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to cover real quick is um, just the importance, again, of being involved in the community. A lot of people I find don't know like, the best way to get involved. And, um, and we don't necessarily always have events for them to be involved in. Um, but you can always just reach out. I get a lot of people that send me emails saying, I want to do science stuff, and it, it'll be that vague. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, science, great. Um, but, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, especially over the summer, a lot of times things are a lot slower for, for um, our organization. But there are other ones that are, you know, that have things going on all the time. But the best thing you can always do just reach out. And so people reach out to me if I don't have anything going on for them to do, I'll send them like, hey, contact Lou at, at Bill Betts or talk to Kelly at Miami Waterkeeper or whatever, you know. Uh, you know, so I'll say Lou has monthly beach cleanups. You can always do that. Um, they also do a beach cleanup on Virginia Key the same Saturday, actually. And, you know, so there's always something going on somewhere. And so even if you reach out to somebody who doesn't have anything going on, as long as we're all connected, like we can always, you know, say, hey, I know we're not doing anything right now, but if you want to be involved, this organization has this thing that they do, and you know, we can always send you somewhere. We can always try to uh, get you involved in any way because everybody really just wants as many people involved as we can. We want everyone to learn. We want everyone to care, and that's really the most important thing to us. So that's all I have. Um, I just wanted to point out quickly, um, if you didn't get one, we do have handouts. Um, they're in the back, and I have some up here that have um, everybody that spoke today is listed and contact information for their organizations. And um, if, uh, if anybody has any questions about anything that was presented, now is the best time to ask. Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering, because I walk the beach a lot now, and I always remember I don't have a plastic bag with me you know, to pick things up so you're loaded down. 
I'm wondering why we can't do, initiate something like the dogs do, pick up their track, the dog poop, and on the beach. So as you go into the beach, maybe grab a bag and do some picking up um, randomly. Uh, would this be something the citizen science group would want to get involved in, or build bags, or and who takes care of the beach from the condos all day long? Um, that, I believe, is the village. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's the village. And I think that's actually part of the area where I was saying the manager of public work wants to start doing beach cleanups. Um, but do I you know think that it would work? Um, it, it, it could work. So there is also the problem bag. of um, people pulling bags out of the bags. There is a problem. Right. If I can speak on that, yeah, there is an organization that is putting forth a a uh, dispenser of plastic bags. I'm sorry. That's what I'm talking about. Right. That's already being done um, for here? me. Not here. They're, it's being offered. I agree with Ronya in that you provide um, a thing full of plastic bags for someone to pull one, and you as a responsible citizen would pull one bag. However, there is a large proponent of mischief that goes on at the beach, and whether or not those bags would stay exactly. one per person, or they would become the plastic bags scattered exactly. everywhere out oh, to the water exactly. and contribute. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I liked it when the person presented it to me, but I also think that we have to consider if it will stay, is there a way to make it, and then who's, gonna, who's responsible for refilling the bags? When you, who buys it if you have to buy the bag? This particular company that had this idea was selling a particular type of bag that would fit in the dispenser. So nothing wrong with the idea at all, but always a thought of how is how are you going to start it, how are you going to maintain it, and how are you going to regulate it to make sure that it doesn't become a bigger problem for the community rather than a solution. How are you going to know if you don't try it? Well, there's that, but then if, if it's tried and then turns out to be a huge failure, then that's a huge financial burden. So um, I think it's more about just like trying to try smaller scale things and doing research and seeing how well they work. Um, I know another thing I heard is just having more trash cans. Um, this the stat that I got from Lou is what people don't want to walk more than 18 feet or something or 18 Walt steps Disney or something like that. Sand is hot too. Walt <laughs> yeah. Disney did research before he started his um, amusement parks. And the average person will not walk more than about 23 okay. steps before they will drop their <coughs> garbage on the ground. One of the things that I didn't mention before, but I did go out and just talk to people on the beach and hand them a trash bag and say, please help me. I'm the assistant park manager, and we can't do it by ourselves. We need your help. And you tie your garbage in the bag when you're done, you leave it by the garbage can, and we'll come get it. But they have um, a lot of incredible bags, do they not? I mean, a lot of the, uh, Bags companies have Possibly. biodegradable, so if you have small biodegradable bags, I mean, when I walk the beach, I come back with my pockets like this. Yes. Right. So, and how long does it take to biodegrade? That's so, um, I think it's, I, I don't know, but it's less than 100 years, obviously. But right. they're actually, they biodegrade fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And so what's in the bag was probably not biodegradable, but at least it's been put into a disposable unit of some sort. Right. I'm not saying it's not a good idea. I think you should look into it. We'll, we will. And I'll help you. <laughs> I, I have a question. Is any pressure being put on Dade County to have businesses charge for plastic bags? I know this is a big thing in other cities. In Austin, Texas, in the whole of Austin, Texas, it starts at a dollar per plastic bag. It goes upward to $5. I'm telling you, it works. When that people are charged for plastic bags, they think twice about it. Um, so I'm not, we don't really do that in Miami Dade County. Um, there is uh, a lot of problems um, trying to do that in Florida because uh, there is a state law that bans any kind of ban on plastics. Yeah, but as the um, city itself, can they? Right. So, so that's something that that we're working on. It usually, it has to be a voluntary program. Um, we actually did just have a meeting about this last week for Keep Escape. And so we are going to try a sort of grassroots initiative to get stores to voluntarily um, hand out reusable bags that people can just bring with them and then also start charging a surcharge 
four plastic bags so that people so, will not use yeah. it as much. But that's, it's all, that's a law through the whole. Right, yeah. Long here long in Florida. Long. other cities have done it too. Right. You know, here, here in Florida, it's very much in its infancy. Um, but I know that there are like some organizations that are pushing for that, and we are. So there's no kind of lawsuits or pressure or anything like that that could be done? Um, I mean, not the kind of lawsuits that are helpful. Um, Coral Gables just banned plastic bags, and uh, they were immediately sued by the state. Um, so, um, right, yeah, and there are some places that do that. And after Coral Gables um, uh, passed their ban on plastic bags, despite the fact that they're being sued by the state, um, I can't remember what store it was, but they voluntarily decided to um, uh, get rid of their plastic bags. Public, yeah. Public, yeah. Public, yeah. Public, yeah. Public, yeah. Public, yeah. Public, right, yeah. So there are a lot of places, a lot of stores that are starting to do it voluntarily, but that's it's also just convincing them to do it because it is way cheaper to use plastic bags. And so just convincing uh, corporations of that is, is very difficult when, it's, when they don't have to do it. I think the village has also banned the use of styrofoam. Yeah, yeah, the village has a whole lot of Any other questions? Well, I just want to make a comment. Um, when, I, when I walk on the beach, or friends of mine walk on the beach, is this thing working? Yeah, it, it's, for, it's for the, the live stream. Just oh, stay here. Um, I always take bags with me mm -hmm. to walk the beach because there's always so much trash. So I pick it up and, and then just put it in one of the trash receptacles and continue on. Every time I do this or I see someone doing it, people will come up to me or to the person doing it and say, what a great idea. Thank you so much. So there's a way to lead just by example, yes. rather than, you know, laws or whatever. No, absolutely. And that's, yeah. that's what we try to do is just encourage everybody to understand and know and do the right thing. And that's actually what she was getting at. She's like, you know, what if I'm there and I want to pick up trash, but I don't have anything to put it in? Yeah, um, and Make sure you do. Right. Well, you know, that's, yeah. Or, you know, find Lou if you're at Bill Bag and she'll give you a plastic bag or something right away. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things. The, the girl that came and gave us the presentation on plastic pollution, um, she is very, very, like, overzealous. Well, not one of those essentially really for that. But, I mean, when it comes to cleaning, every, like, daily almost, she is out at the beach picking up trash, and she organizes beach cleanups constantly all over the place in different places. And, you know, and, and she has had a huge impact on a lot of, she's actually a, a very good friend of mine, and she's had a huge impact just on my friends. You know, just being around you, we feel ashamed for not doing more. Yeah. You know, and not that we want to shame people into it, but at the same time, it really it makes you much more conscious of what's going on. So yeah, I mean, definitely, it's it's a good habit to get into, or just have like containers in your car, or something that you can use. You know, just keep them there all the time. That's where I keep my reusable bags in the grocery store. Is there a more general question? Yeah. Island. 
We were informed by a citizen report that there was a belief to be a leak. Uh, so we sent out a Miami Waterkeeper diver to the location that the report suggested, and we confirmed that leak with video evidence. Um, instead of just jumping the gun, we went to the county and we asked for any reports about this leak and any efforts they've taken to address this leak, uh, because we were told that the, originally the county was notified that this leak was happening. So we want to give them the benefit of the doubt to check out uh, the leak before we take further action. And that's what we did. Unfortunately, we went to the county and what our investigation revealed was that the county has known about this leak for a year, uh, possibly longer, and has failed to take any action to correct the leak. As you can see, if the video doesn't play that, it's fine. You can still see the leak here. It's a, a six inch in diameter, approximately leak. Um, the county has reported since the incident, since last Monday when we reported the leak to the county, they've logged um, 92,000 92, gallons of sewage, um, partially treated sewage, that have, has leaked into the Atlantic Ocean from this. Um, and if you do the math on that, uh, that translates to, over the course of a year, potentially millions of gallons of uh, a partially treated sewage that has leaked into the ocean from this leak in particular, um, that since it hasn't been addressed. In that so a brief overview for those of you who don't know how our sewage system works here in Miami. Uh, this is a graphic from the Miami Herald that I think does a really good job of explaining. Uh, so when you flush the toilet at home, uh, if you're connected to our sewage system in Miami, um, many people are still connected to, the sept to individual septic tanks, but assuming you're connected to the sewage system, uh, when you flush the toilet, that sewage goes directly to one of three sewage treatment plants, which are called wastewater treatment plants. Um, the one we're talking about today is the Central District Plant on Virginia Key, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Um, the Central District Plant treats that sewage into what's called treated effluent. The effluent, at this point in time, uh, it's pumped out through what are called ocean outfall pipes. And those ocean outfall pipes um, take that partially treated sewage, that, uh, that effluent that goes through secondary treatment, um, and they pump it three and a half miles offshore. Um, unfortunately, this leak that we're talking about is occurring three quarters of a mile from shore. So it's a lot closer than is what is permitted uh, under uh, the sewage treatment plant's permits um, and the consent decree, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So here's the timeline of events for those of you who are interested. Uh, the Central District Treatment Plant was created in 1956, the North District Treatment Plant in 1975. As you can tell, these are old pipes we're talking about here. And those pipes um, that are connected to the ocean outfall system undergo a lot of pressure from the, from the sewage that is constantly pumped through them. And on top of it, there are uh, buried pipes under the ocean floor. And as many of you know, the Seine Bay is very salty and salt corrodes metal. And those pipes inevitably corrode and decay and we have an aging sewage infrastructure that has a lot of problems and subsequently has a lot of leaks. In fact, the leaks were so bad that in 2012, the federal government sued Miami-Dade County for failure to appropriate adequate funding to address sewage leaks. At that time, we're talking millions upon millions of gallons of raw and partially treated sewage were going into Biscayne Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. How many of you lived in Key Biscayne in 2012? How many of you remember the beach closures that happened at that time? There were a lot of beach closures uh, and no contact advisories issues because of these frequent sewage leaks. As I mentioned, the, the lawsuit alleged 20 million gallons of raw and untreated sewage. So it's a lot of raw and untreated sewage. Um, and what resulted from the lawsuit is what's called a consent decree. And that's a legally binding settlement agreement between the state of Florida, uh, Miami-Dade County, and the federal government uh, to force the county to invest $1.6 billion on capital infrastructure improvements to the aging sewage infrastructure system. Now that includes pipes, and wastewater treatment plants. Miami Waterkeeper originally became involved because this huge investment was about to be made into sewage infrastructure, and yet there was no requ requisite planning for climate change and sea level rise in those infrastructure improvements. And as you may know, 
uh, when we have major storms, such as storms that are uh, associated with climate change, increase in intensity and frequency of the storms, uh, our sewage systems become compromised. Even last week, we saw in Miami Beach, they had a ton of flooding because of just a small storm. Um, and, and those are all things that are uh, attributable to the sewage infrastructure system and the wastewater treatment system. So we brought a lawsuit. Thankfully, the county uh, uh, obliged by our request voluntarily, so we didn't have to continue with the lawsuit, and so they were required from that point on to consider uh, climate change in those infrastructure projects. Nevertheless, in 2015, there continued to be millions of gallons of sewage spills um, and unpermitted discharges from these pipes. So this is just further evidence that this is an ongoing problem and that this is something that the county is addressing, but perhaps they're not addressing it quick enough. Um, during the six month period, uh, between 2014 and 2015, over one million gallons of sewage spilled over the course of 64 different leaks. And those are only the ones that we know about. So let's keep that in mind. Fast forward to June of 2017, just this summer, we had another unpermitted discharge of over 760,000 gallons of raw sewage into Biscayne Bay. In fact, a no contact advisory was issued for the marine protected area of Biscayne Bay Aquatic Preserves. So we're talking in one of our most protected and vulnerable areas, we're dumping hundreds of thousands of gallons of raw sewage. Uh, surely it's an accident, but we can't afford to have these accidents continue to happen. Uh, next slide, please. So again, early this summer, we started. To, we received a citizen report of a, a partially treated sewage leak into the ocean, and we started to conduct our investigation. Uh, we revealed a our investigation revealed a series of emails between county staff and supervisors, which I'll show you, which indicated their awareness of the leak uh, from last summer and their failure to do anything to address it. Um, for those of you who are wondering, this we believe is a violation of the Clean Water Act, the consent decree various state uh, regulations and permitting requirements that the county has, um, and more than anything, the most important thing I think that we found out from this investigation, while the sewage leak itself um, has been immediately addressed, and I'll get to that later, but what we ended up finding out was that inspections of the sewage pipes, the outfall pipes, have not been conducted in over 10 years. And if you have this series of events that I've just laid out for you all occurring over the past 10 years, and the county still has failed to inspect the pipes, it's completely unacceptable and it's completely in violation of their permit requirements to maintain and repair the pipes. So it's basically like saying, um, you know, there may be leaks, but if we don't look, we don't have to fix them. And unfortunately, our economy and our culture here in South Florida relies on relies on clean water and it's just something we can't afford um, to, to bypass and we need to have these inspections conducted. So again, this is just an overview. These inspections were never conducted. It's a failure to comply with permit and consent decree obligations um, and it's a consistent and ongoing problem that we're seeing in the county and it's again really unacceptable. So I just wanted to give you guys some examples so you know that I'm uh, <laughs> not pulling this out of thin air. So we were able to retrieve the emails through a public records request from, from the county. This email was sent in last summer, 2016. It says, the last time that the outfall discharge lines were inspected was 10 years ago. The general permit requirement and obligation to properly operate and maintain our facilities at all times. This is from the permitting section head from Water and Sewer, and he's saying, I recommend that an underwater inspection be performed along the outfall discharge lines and their respective manholes and all other appurtenances. Uh, in response to that email, we see uh, uh, the acting assistant director of wastewater. I don't know that we have the funding set aside for this, uh, for this activity. You don't know that you have the funding set aside, so what was that $1.6 billion consent decree? Deputy director responds, I agree, it's time to inspect the pipes. Oh. Everyone seems to agree. In, wait, go back one, sorry. You can see the date of that email, July 4th, 2016. Did they conduct the inspections? No, they did not. Fast forward August 2016. We received a report from a lobster fisherman. The outfall has a leak in about 17 feet of water and three quarter mile from shore. 
You might have seen in the news, the county said, we weren't able to locate the leak. We sent people out there. We couldn't find it. If you read this email, 17 feet of water, water three-quarter mile from shore on the outfall pipe. Approximate position of the junction box were the original 72-inch ties into the newer 120-inch pipe. That seems like very specific information. Does it not? Yes. yes. It seems like a pretty poor excuse when you say that you were unable to locate the leak when you receive an email and a report from a citizen like this. So as I mentioned, history of crappy problems at the county. They have a $1.6 billion consent decree with the federal government that obligates them to do these types of operation and maintenance activities. We see it's a pervasive problem. We had a spill in 2017. We've had millions of gallons of sewage spilled since 2014. And it's just an ongoing chronic problem within the county of failing to invest in an in existing infrastructure while putting that consent decree funding toward new infrastructure. What needs to happen is we need to start putting that funding towards the lines that already exist, even though they are decaying, even though they are old, and even though we will be decommissioning ocean outfalls by 2025, we can't wait between now and 2025 to let these pipes continue to decay in our backyards and to continue to have these ongoing sewage leaks. So some of you may be wondering, what are the health impacts that we're thinking that we're facing here? Well, raw sewage um, contains things like heavy metals, organic pollutants, E. coli, other dangerous bacteria. These types of toxins impact immune systems, hormone function, reproduction in humans. Uh, these toxins bioaccumulate in fish, which makes the eventual consumption of fish unsafe for humans. Um, and people can become ill from drinking, swimming, and or engaging in water activities. Um, and even get things such as superficial skin rashes or gastrointestinal illnesses. Uh, and so this is something we don't really want to mess around with. Granted, in this case, the leak was a partially treated sewage leak. So these types of contaminants are far less. But that doesn't mean that it's safe to be around. And it doesn't mean that it's safe for you to swim in or touch or um, eat fish from. Next. So what are the economic impacts? There are a lot of economic impacts associated with sewage spill. Not only the actual mitigation and the cleanup itself, this spill in particular, the emergency bid went out to fix the, fix the leak last week, cost $69,000 oh, to fix that leak. And it's a six inch pipe leak. Um, but it also impacts tourism. Our economy is really heavily reliant on tourism. It impacts commerce, property values, things, um, your own real estate values here on the key. People are not going to want to and come to this area if they know that there are chronic sewage leaks in the bay and in the ocean. And then, of course, there are ecological impacts. So toxic chemicals can kill fish and harm other wildlife and other marine life. Uh, sewage can physically suffocate fish. Um, by removing dissolved oxygen from the water, so there's not enough oxygen in the water for the fish to breathe. Suspended sewage particles prevent sunlight from reaching underwater plants, such as sea grasses, and can impact growth rates. Um, and then, of course, juveniles are really susceptible to the impacts from sewage spills, um, and the toxins do bioaccumulate in fish. And on top of that, there are um, implications for things like algae blooms um, that we start to see. Even if you remember last summer up at the Indian River Lagoon, they had chronic spills coming from their septic tanks up there, which is what caused this dramatic algae bloom and massive fish kill. Um, and the fish actually started to make people very sick and they were hospitalized uh, and things like that. So we're trying to avoid that here in Miami. You don't need those types of impacts. Um, and we certainly don't need those impacts in our ecology either. So who's going to fix it? Uh, the county is going to fix out into that in one second. So we filed a notice of intent to sue under the Clean Water Act. We allege that um, the county is in violation of the Clean Water Act, along with various other state regulations and permits. Um, and we're requesting that they fix the leak, they inspect the outfalls within 120 days, they revise their consent decree, that binding settlement agreement, <coughs> to uh, incorporate a regular schedule of maintenance. Um, we want them to conduct an impact assessment and do any restoration or mitigation that might be necessary and, um, that's associated with this leak. And then in lieu of civil penalties, we're asking that they donate $750,000 to the Biscayne Bay Restoration Trust Fund. And 
And that's a trust fund that's county run um, that provides funding to restoration projects in Biscayne Bay. So we're asking them to donate money to themselves, <laughs> essentially. Um, so the latest news, the county, the county claims to have conducted an inspection of the leak. Um, and they issued an emergency bid to stop the leak last week, which they have done. The leak has been, however, only temporarily patched. It has not been repaired. Um, that repair will take another four to six weeks to complete. And you can understand why the county doesn't want to do these types of inspections, because then they find the leaks, and it's very costly and time-consuming for them to fix them. Um, the county has conducted water quality sampling, which have shown negligible impacts. Um, that may be true at this point in time in terms of human health, but uh, the long-term impacts on the environment are still sort of unknown. This leak has been ongoing for uh, basically a year at this point, and uh, those types of cumulative impacts have not been studied. And again, this is evidence of a greater problem. I think that we are aware of this leak, of this leak thanks to a citizen report, but we're unsure how many other leaks are currently ongoing. Right, um, especially because the county is not conducting these inspections as they should be. Um, so there are many other leaks that exist at this point in time, and we're simply unaware, which is why we're asking the county to do their due diligence and to inspect the full length of the pipes, both at the central district plant and at the north district plant. So how can you help? You can support our efforts. Mighty Waterkeeper is a small local nonprofit. We have three full-time staff members. Um, and we could really use your support right now. We have a, a fundraising drive to help us raise money in the event that we do have to continue to sue the county. Um, we're trying to raise $25,000. We're um, approaching the $8,000 mark for that. Um, you can navigate to our website to find out more information how you can support us. Uh, financially, even a small donation means a lot to us. We have been receiving a lot of small $5, $10 donations, and all those add up, and they really make a difference in being, us being able to establish a war chest to address this issue and potentially other issues that come up uh, in the future. You can sign our petition. We have, there is a power in the people, as I like to say, and uh, the uh, cumulative voice of the community is really valuable. So showing your commissioners um, that this is something that you care about and that is something that needs to be a priority for the county is truly invaluable. We encourage you to sign our petition. We have a few hundred signatures on there. We could really use your support when we have meetings with county commissioners and even state uh, representatives that have reached out to us about things that they can do to help solve this problem. You can become a member of Miami Waterkeeper. If you become a member of Miami Waterkeeper, you give us what's called standing to sue. So we're bringing our Clean Water Act lawsuit under a citizen suit provision of the Clean Water Act. That means that um, an average citizen can sue uh, the polluter um, if they have some type of interest in uh, the resource that's at stake. So our members, the people that live on Key Biscayne, the people that have coastal properties, allow us to be able to bring this lawsuit on their behalf in order to hold the county accountable uh, for these sewage leaks. So becoming a member is not just a financial donation to Miami Waterkeeper, it's actually uh, a strategic commitment to allow us to sue on your behalf uh, for these issues. Um, and then I think most importantly is stay informed and spread the word. This uh, report of this leak came to us from a citizen just like you. And I think it's so important to know that we are a watchdog for this watershed. We look over, or we watch over Biscayne Bay and the Atlantic Ocean in this area. And without that citizen report, we would never have known that this was happening. Um, so it's so important to, to let us know if you see something, say something. And then, of course, you can um, stay informed and spread the word. Um, the more people that are educated about this issue, the quicker it will be resolved. You can find us on all social media platforms. And then, of course, if you're interested in staying up to date on the latest, we're trying to send out weekly uh, news blasts, small news blasts uh, related to the sewage leak. So if you're really interested in staying on top of that and how you can be involved and how you can help, you can sign up on our email list. It's in the back table. Um, and then I'm always happy to chat with you offline about ways that you can get involved with our organization and, and the work that we're doing to make sure that these types of issues don't happen and again, if you have any questions, please send me an email or give us a call. Um, this is something that I know that we really care about. It might be Waterkeeper for environmental reasons, but it's also a really big public health issue, and we really want to get this resolved um, in terms of this leak, but also any other potential leaks that might be happening. Happy
happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, I think that's playing out right now. Uh, so we only sent this letter last week. So I think those types of uh, changes might be happening at the county level. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, but yes, we certainly hope that some people are held accountable. You saw that series of emails just like I saw. It's pretty incriminating. Um, and it was obviously blatantly ignored. Um, so, yes. Um, when will this I called the village, I called uh, Cape Florida State Park and Fran, and interestingly enough, thank you, Lou, your organization was the only one that returned my call. But from them, I got a contact at the state of Florida, and here's what is amazing to me. There's a huge disconnect between Dade County and the Florida Department of Health. Right, which supposedly, if we believe what they say, and this young man, David Folk, who has called me three times about this, every Monday, every swimming beach in the state of Florida is tested for water quality. And if it, then there's a poor quality, which is the worst. And if after two days of poor quality, they're supposed to report it, two days, not one, right. but two, um, to the local authorities so that the beaches can be advised to be closed or as it happened five or six years ago. What is amazing to me is that this gentleman, who's been very, very cooperative, says that all this sewage is fully treated. And the information you have is that it is not. It, it's partially treated. It's, it, it, they're not wrong when they say it's up to EPA standards. It, it is up to EPA standards. It doesn't mean you want to go swimming where the alcohol is. Um, I mean, it, it's partially treated. There are still contaminants in the water. The idea is that by pumping it out to the ocean alcohol, uh, dilution will take care of the rest. Uh, so the washing machine that is the ocean will mix up the remainder and, uh, you know, eventually the contaminants will dissipate and be in such low concentrations that they won't impact human health. Unfortunately, what he's failing to mention to you is that is supposed to happen three and a half miles from shore. This leak yes, is happening three quarters of a mile from shore. He also brought to my attention that the Miami Waterkeepers issue was what caused them to approach and, and catch that within one day, really. And when it was attacked immediately and then the next day, the company, Rick, Rickman Construction, mm -hmm. did that patching. And then within four to six weeks, as you said, Supposedly, they're going to close down that line completely right. to repair the entire sewage line. Are, I mean, can we believe these things? It's hard to say. I mean, we're hopeful that that is what's going to happen, mostly because the state and the federal government are already in a binding legal settlement with the county over this, so they have a lot of stake um, and they have ability to. Um, there are provisions in their settlement agreement that let, allow them to reinstate their lawsuit against the county. So you would think that that's enough incentive for the county to get their act together, but only only time will talk. So we just have to sort of sit and wait at this point. Yes. Um, you said that in uh, 2025 they aren't going to have these out points into the ocean right. the bay. So what is the alternative? Plan. If you're not dumping it in the ocean and the bay, what is going to happen to the sewage? That's a great question. I mean, I can see that. If you click back to that slide, I think it's like the second or third slide. So, um, as I mentioned, the outfalls are going to be decommissioned in 2025 pursuant to some state legislation that was passed a few years ago. So the new plan is, is that instead of pumping it out via ocean outfall where it's mixed with the currents and the Gulf Stream and taken offshore and you know, dilution is the solution to pollution, I suppose, um, they're going to deep well inject it. That's the plan right now. So they're going to partially treat the, the sewage and they are going to deep well inject it below the Biscayne Aquifer, which is our primary source of drinking water in South Florida. And um, through our secondary source of drinking water in South Florida, which is the Florida Aquifer. So they're going to deep well inject past both of our drinking water sources um, and pump it into what's called the Boulder Zone. Uh, this is currently the plan, and it's not just going to be uh, wastewater, um, so partially treated sewage or raw sewage, or rather partially treated, uh, but it's also going to be landfill leachate. 
So all that nice stuff that's uh, leaching out of our landfills is also going to be pumped down uh, through, I would say, both of our aquifers uh, and into the boulder zone. And through you know, a pipe. Through, through a pipe. pipe. Yeah, through a pipe. That's correct. Um, and there is some ongoing scientific debate as to whether or not the boulder zone will be able to confine that uh, wastewater. As you may know, our bedrock formations here are limestone, which are very porous. Is, some people call it um, ancient coral reef. It's a sedimentary rock that's been compressed over time, but it, it's sort of like a sponge. And so to say that this wastewater is going to sit in one spot um, is currently up for scientific debate. This isn't a very popular or universal industry standard for removing wastewater. Um, and in fact, the most popular use of deep well injection right now is for fracking, which has caused a lot of problems um, for many places. Even I just heard in Oklahoma had another earthquake last week, I think, because of uh, fracking injection. So um, there are problems associated with that. At Miami Waterkeeper, what we think would be the best solution is to, at this point, repair the outfall pipes treat the outfall water to a higher degree so that way we keep that water in the water cycle rather than pumping it down into the boulder zone where we'll never be able to use it or access it again in the event that we do need uh, access to water or have a water supply shortage or something like that. Um, and then of course reusing the water as best we can for things like irrigation and, and other reuse projects. Um, so. We have some qualms about this deep well injection, and we're, we're taking a look at it right now. Um, they are receiving, uh, actually just received a permit to be able to deep well inject last week. So we're reviewing that permit um, as we speak. I'll probably do it today. <laughs> are, are they going to deep well inject from, from Virginia Key? Yes. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of those exploratory wells are already constructed. Questions? All right. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you sticking around so I can uh, brief you on this issue. I think it's really important, and I'm so glad that you all are involved and care about it. Uh, I'll be in the back.